Don't Nod Entertainment are probably most well known these days for their telltale-esque narrative adventures like Life is Strange and... Tell me why. But did you know that they also used to make actual video games? With gameplay and stuff to do? Well, they did. And ironically, the game in question is called Remember Me, as if it was a deliberate attempt to tempt fate by making a game that nobody seems to recall exists these days. Now I am being facetious here. I've played a little of Life is Strange and got bored after the first episode, so I never played any of the other games in the same mold. Maybe there's stuff worth discovering here, so I wouldn't know if all these games are just walking and talking with nothing else to do. And I also know that they made Vampire or Vampire or however you were supposed to pronounce it a couple of years ago. I actually have that one on the chopping block for some later time as well. However, I felt an urge to finally play Remember Me because back when I first learned about it, I heard a few good things. What almost immediately struck out to me was its aesthetic. If you cast your mind back into the fog of history to my previous review of Control, I mentioned that a good aesthetic always trumps graphics. And while I wouldn't call Remember Me's graphics bad, they definitely date the game to its particular time of release. But its aesthetic shows a wonderfully realized cyberpunk world. Neo Paris, despite its trite name, is a hauntingly beautiful cityscape, especially considering how many of the environments showcase a dilapidated or slummy atmosphere. It's a very vibrant take on the cyberpunk aesthetic, and I personally can't say I've seen anything like it before. The only other games I know that similarly meld contemporary architecture with a futuristic cyberpunk aesthetic are the newer Deus Ex games, though unfortunately it's often not that easy to appreciate the wonderful aesthetic because of the way the camera in this game behaves. For one, it has an unnecessarily narrow field of view, so in tight spaces it's almost impossible to really get a good look at anything. This can often also impact gameplay because stuff you need to see can get obscured by the weird angles the camera moves into to make sure it doesn't clip through the scenery. And whenever you're not in a tight space, but also not in combat, the camera has a nasty habit of creeping up on the main character Nilin to an uncomfortable degree. Even for a game that has clearly targeted consoles over PC and is intended to be played on a TV in the living room, this is way too close for comfort. It almost feels like the camera wants to invade her personal space. And unfortunately, the camera often just does whatever it wants, trying to focus on something instead of giving the player full control over what they want to see. And it also never stops fucking moving. I swear, you can stand perfectly still and not move any of the analog sticks at all, and the camera still drunkenly wobbles around. Tying into the beautiful aesthetic is a wonderfully eclectic soundtrack. I usually don't really talk a lot about the music in games unless to point out deficiencies. Mostly because I feel that if the sound of a game does its job at not being bad or distracting, it's often not worth commenting on. It's rare for me to find music like this, where I have to really commend the game for incorporating something that makes me look forward to its combat just to get to hear more of its excellent soundtrack. There's an infectious energy to the tunes in this game that really gets you pumped up to fight, and the selected timbral variety makes it sound utterly unique to my ears. It perfectly complements the visuals in that both sight and sound offer something different. Now speaking of the combat, here's another thing that very much dates this game. Since this is a third-person character action game, it closely follows into the footsteps of another game that pretty much defined how this kind of combat would work for the following years, and that Batman Arkham Asylum. If you haven't encountered this type of combat system before, it's characterized by being very flashy to look at while requiring next to no skill from the player. You can just mash the attack button, and whenever one of the enemies telegraphs an attack that always gets highlighted by some kind of non-diegetic prompt, you can dodge out of the way. Targeting enemies is largely not a thing in this type of combat system, so the player character darts around between enemies and takes targeting input more as a general suggestion. And Remember Me's combat follows this philosophy very clearly closely. However, there is a neat little tweak in there that I like, and that is that you can customize your attacks. The game has a little combo builder that allows you to slot in attacks that have certain side effects, such as healing you or shortening the cooldown timers on certain abilities. So when you're in a fight, you can choose which combos to execute to trigger whatever side effects you intend to have. I like how this makes combat a bit more strategic than your typical third-person action game combat from that era that mostly just dealt with inelegant button mashing or the old dodge and counterattack move that Assassin's Creed heavily relies on. While this certainly makes combat more entertaining, it's kinda undone by how long each of the combat sections gets drawn out. For one, a lot of the enemies just have stupid amounts of health, so it takes ages to defeat most of them. And while I commend the game for having a surprising variety of enemies in there, many are frustrating to deal with. For example, there's this one enemy type that hurts you when you hit them. And there's just no other way of dealing with them when you first encounter them, you have to hit them. The solution is to use the aforementioned combo system to create a combo that heals you with every hit they take. 
Unfortunately, the first hit of every combo is one that can't have any special side effects, so over time you still lose health either way and have to strategically keep other enemies around to regain some health if you don't want to die trying to take them out. There is a special ability that lets you turn invisible to take out these enemies in a quote-unquote stealth takedown, but if there are no more enemies around where you can use the attacks that shorten the cooldown timer, you're just stuck running out the clock if you don't want to lose health while fighting them. Also, this frenetic button mashy combat system to me simply doesn't jive well with incorporating priority targets. This is exemplified by these robots that sometimes hover around outside of the reach of your melee attacks. You are also outfitted with a projectile attack that comes in the traditional weak and strong flavor. It was clearly not an integral part of the combat design because it's a very situational attack that doesn't offer a lot of flexibility. And as such, it mostly just gets used to deal with these robots since you have no other means of dealing with them. There's also a token grunt with a shield that can only be dispatched by shooting at it and a boss fight that gets repeated that relies on you spamming this attack exclusively, but those feel more like token implementations to acknowledge the mechanic because it otherwise never seems to be all that useful beyond some of the puzzles. Another enemy type that feels rather gimmicky key are the ones that are invisible in the dark. They can only be made visible by using one of the special attacks that stuns them or by turning on a floodlight or waiting for one that turns on and off periodically. It was neat when it happened the first time when I had to turn on the light manually, but later fights got so crowded that this too felt like dragging out the runtime. It adds this needless puzzle element to the combat that only further lengthens these fights to the point where even the excellent music can salvage later fights that just turn into endless barrages of waves of enemies spawning in one after the other. Never mind that I'm not sure why these enemies are even invisible in the first place. I don't think it ever gets explained what about them causes that, but we'll get to that when I discuss the narrative. Outside of combat, Remember Me seems to take a lot of inspiration from Uncharted, with the levels being mostly fairly linear tunnels that only ever fork into one side room that contains one of the many collectibles in this game. During those linear treks, the game mostly relies on climbing around the scenery as a means of engagement. Honestly, it wasn't all that great, and I feel that the designers noticed that there wasn't much of a traversal because later levels start incorporating switch puzzles in order to stay fresh, and it's never a good sign when Puzzle Design 101 starts making an appearance. If ever a game cried out to be more open world, it's this one, because you can clearly tell that they put a lot of effort into designing the world this game takes place in, and I would have loved to explore some more of it. And no, don't nod, I don't mean exploring it in tie-in novels and comics. Seriously, what is it with video games trying to broaden their audience by offering for-profit fanfiction? Just put this stuff in the actual games. And speaking of that, well, we now have to discuss what actually happens in this game. And that means talking about the narrative. But that necessarily means that I'll have to spoil it to discuss it properly. I'll give you a little TLDR here if you think you still want to play this game after all, and I'll issue a spoiler warning before I discuss any of the details. The title of the game should give you a pretty big clue as to what Remember Me deals with thematically, which is memories. The entire narrative is based upon the concept of memories, very much inspired by Total Recall and its underlying literary source, a Philip K. Dick story titled We Can Remember It For You Wholesale. In Remember Me, people have figured out a way to preserve of memories and, more crucially, also how to remove bad memories outright via a special implant. Only, some part of the population has formed an addictive habit around it. Because you know you can't simply have a new technology without it also coming with a convenient downside that serves to make a broader point in a cyberpunk story. There has also emerged a group of people called memory hunters, people who can extract memories out of other people. The protagonist, Nilin, is also a memory hunter, or more accurately, was. The game actually starts with probably the only case of amnesia I've ever seen in a video game that made sense and wasn't just a cheap way of starting a story in media's res. The game begins in the Bastille, still a prison in Neo Paris, only this time for people who have all their memories wiped. Nilin is an inmate who, after the memory wipe, gets contacted by a former associate of hers and sent on a quest to retrieve her memories. It's around this time where you learn that Nilin can't just extract memories but also remix them, meaning she can change them to change the person's worldview or personality in some way. I found this concept really intriguing. It opens up an interesting discussion about human personalities and how we're really just a cumulative product of all our previous experiences. The game also turns this memory remixing into a gameplay concept itself, which is probably the best part of the entire game. I certainly see where Don't Nod got the idea for Life is Strange's time travel shenanigans from. It's a pretty obvious evolution on the way memory remixing in Remember Me works. The basic principle is that you get to experience a key memory and get the ability to scrub back and forth in it to change certain aspects about 
without it. And if you change the correct bits, the memory plays out in a different way that somehow ends up changing the person. I admit that it felt a little weird to do so because, you know, you're just kinda messing with free will here if you can change a person's core beliefs and motivations just by changing how they think an event took place. But it's still unfortunate that the memory remixing only happens a grand total of four times over the course of the entire game. Heck, this gameplay idea could have probably carried the entire game and I would have loved to see more of this instead of the drawn out combat. But alas, it wasn't meant to be. Given that the narrative concerns memories and we start the game with a character who has lost all of hers at the beginning of the game, you can probably already see where the game's narrative points to and yep, there are a bunch of twists incoming that relate to Nilan's past. And unfortunately they're not the interesting kind of twist that somehow massively change the dynamic of the key players in the story or recontextualize the entire narrative up to now. No, the twists actually serve to make an initially sprawling world much smaller than it needs to be in ways that I can't really explore in a vague manner so I guess it's time to start the spoilers here. If you wish to not hear any spoilers, skip ahead to this timecode or use the chapter heading in the description. Ready? Here we go. After Nilin gets her memories wiped, she gets contacted by Edge, the guitarist of the band U2 and the leader of a resistance movement that calls themselves the Errorists. Oh, you thought Neo Paris was as bad as it gets with on the nose naming? Yeah, I always cringe whenever that name was used because it's both nonsensical and it just sounds dumb. At least when NoFX used it as an album title, it carried some kind of meaning, but here it's just a word that's supposed to sound cool, I guess. And you thought the hackneyed writing started with Life is Strange? Nah, large parts of this game have equally cringeworthy lines in delivery. This little Red Riding Hood's got a basket full of kickass! Anyway, Edge instructs Nilin to first get her memories back and then go after Memorize, the company that developed the sensing technology that allows for the storing and removal of memories, which has had a considerable impact on how humans live their lives in this world. The first couple of missions are basically just set up for the world, story and themes, and I admit that they do a pretty good job. I especially like the Slum 404. After you get there and commit your first morally objectionable memory remix, your next assignment consists of stealing secret plans of an architect in order to break open a dam to open up access to the Bastille. Oh, and there's also that side effect that all the water that drains from the slums floods the district where all the wealthy people live, because this game has a message. The reason you have to go back to the Bastille after just escaping from it is to get your memories back. At least some of them. Among them is a memory of Nilin remixing another person that ended up committing suicide because of it, which was the crime that got her convicted in the first place before the start of the game. After that's done, the next target is the CEO of Memorize itself, to convince her that the corporation's methods and goals are wrong. Yeah, the game ramps up the stakes pretty quickly here. And it's at this point where the first big twist comes in, which is that the CEO is Nilan's mother. Yep. Turns out that, as is often the case with these types of stories, the parents of the revolutionary protagonists are part of the corporation fucking over everyone else. See what I meant by saying that the twists make the world smaller earlier? It ties the narrative down and reduces the conflict to interpersonal squabbles between family members and it doesn't really serve as a parable for the rest of humanity. Heck, even Star Wars had more than just Luke Skywalker's daddy issues. But in the end, this mostly just plays out as a family drama. The memory Nilin has to remix is one from when her mother suffered a car crash that had her end up with a cybernetic prosthetic leg and a lingering sense of bitterness towards the world in general and Nilin in particular. The real memory that happened puts the blame for the crash on Nilin herself for distracting her mother while she was driving. I'm not sure if that event is a great catalyst for wanting to enslave people who have become addicted to your memory technology. Changing her mind isn't enough to stop this enslavement process, so you have to go through a lengthy tangent of dealing with one of the head scientists of the program while also trying to rescue another errorist ally. From a story perspective it's mostly pointless, though incidental occurrences mean that the entire Bastille gets destroyed so the experiments pretty much stop, which is a good thing I guess. I've mentioned that Nilin's parents both play a part in this, so obviously your final goal is your father, who created the sense and technology mostly just to erase Nilin's memory of the aforementioned car crash. Once that succeeds, he gets it in his head to use this technology to help the rest of humanity remove all the bad memories and pain from their lives. I like this turn of events a lot, because so often the mash of evil corporations are just based on a megalomaniacal quest for power from whoever is in charge. I like how the story frames the dystopian state of the world, or at least of Neo Paris, as a result of trying to do good. I'm always fond of speculative fiction that explores the concept of the road to hell is paved with good intentions that doesn't just plonk down a simplistic one-dimensional villain. Once both your parents have successfully been remixed, they open up the access to the central server so you can release all those collected memories back to humanity. It's there where the game takes a hard turn towards neuromancy 
picturesque plotting when it turns out that Edge, who has been giving you all these assignments and is the original founder of the errorist cause against Memorize, has been part of a self-aware amalgamation of all those bad memories that Memorize has collected and who longs to destroy itself for the benefit of mankind. I'm not sure how I feel about this ending because again it makes the world feel smaller yet again. Sure it ends on a positive note that tries to tell people that giving up their bad memories isn't such a great idea because it robs you from any context of how you see your good times. And I think this is what those addicts are supposed to represent, people who have extracted all their memories because they've lost any sense of balance and see everything as bad. But to me the way the narrative is framed, especially with these twists that the most important people are your parents and a malformed entity born out of all the negativity in the world that longs for self-destruction feels a bit too neat and also omits many of the more interesting aspects of the setting and themes that the game touches upon. For one, as mentioned before, the whole ethical conflict of meddling with free will is never explored in any great detail. It comes up during Nilin's introspective monologues, which incidentally are again fairly overwrought because they make her sound like a Lovecraftian narrator with all its purple prose, but in the end it doesn't really contribute to the narrative resolution. It's more seen as a necessary evil, just like how Edge explains that causing damage and harm to the ritzy population of Neo Paris should be celebrated. And honestly, I just feel like the twists the story does have are way less interesting than the ones I came up with in my head while playing and trying to figure it out. For example, the final memory remix is taking place inside Nilan's father while he's remixing young Nilan's memory of the car crash. The fact that that's even possible opens up a whole other can of worms. I mean, what if the entire game was just inside someone else's head? A memory remixed to change their personality or worldview in some way. Something like that is never even explored. Maybe it's just me, but if you have a potentially fourth wall breaking science fiction concept that lets you explore something like this, not doing it seems like a bit of a wasted opportunity. Still, after all is said and done, while Remember Me is far from perfect, I had fun with it. It's a nice little distraction and it has a narrative that at least tries to be about something, even though I feel that it isn't as fleshed out or well explored as I'd like it to be. But honestly, a story that's more about concepts and ideas that tie in nicely with at least some of its gameplay rather than just being a sequence of events that happens between combat and puzzles is commendable. Its best idea, the memory remixing, is criminally underutilized and the game unfortunately favors its combat gameplay more than that. And it stumbles a bit there by making combat simply take too long to get through whenever it happens. So while I can't call Remember Me a great game, given the many things I had to criticize it for, I still think it's worth recommending. As I said in the beginning, I really like the art direction the soundtrack here, and the combat isn't an entirely pointless affair. Honestly, I wouldn't mind seeing Don't Not take another crack at something like this. Maybe tone down the flowery prose a bit and focus more on integrating the memory remixing into the narrative beyond trying to facilitate a few token twists and I'd be happy to play another one.